right. We are recording. All right. I'll do a countdown. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another video. Today, I'm here again with James Elias. I pronounced it right that time, which is great. Um, <laughs> how, are, how are you doing today, man? I'm pretty tired. Uh, I've been working like a lunatic, and I don't know how to take breaks. So, um, oh, yeah. so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 definitely a thing i think i think this morning i was actually working on some like uh math homework and like our our math teacher like with the coronavirus and stuff like we're not i don't know if we're actually gonna get through all our content so i started like reading ahead and i read like three or four chapters this morning and i was just taking notes and i'm like why am i doing this i, I wasn't even required to do any of this and i would just get exhausted nice. doing it and then <laughs> but hey it, it, it is what it is i i learned about line integrals today oh cool Nice, nice. Yeah. Did does does did the Booker teacher give you any indication of what a line integral refers to in reality? Um, well, sort of like, There's when, a like when, when, when you're do, when you're doing like when like let's say something is moving in a curve, right? It's mm -hmm. moving like around. Like, let's say there's a gravitational object, right? Like the Earth, for example, and you're moving in a certain uh, line around mm -hmm. that in a certain way. And there's like a, a vector field basically of what the gravitational pull is towards it. So then the line integral would basically be like how much work the gravitational field is doing on that object when it's moving along that curve. Yeah, right. So it's, I, I, I try, I try to connect things to reality. No, that's, as, as much that's as really can, good. Is, that's exactly, good. that's actually, as far as I know, that's the only, that's the only application I know of a line integral yeah. myself. Yeah. And there's, there's also like, I'm sure there's like electric charge and those sort of things too. Like basically anything work. with a potential field. Yeah. Yeah. With like work. Potential yeah. field is just work, but like yep. stripped of one layer of abstraction. See when, when I was learning that concept in uh, calculus three, I asked the TA, mm -hmm. What is I asked the TA, what does this refer to? I didn't say it that way because it was I'd only been an objectivist for I yeah. think like two years at that point. But I just said, like, is there I, I I had to word it a certain way, but I asked just what the hell does this refer to? And the and the TA said it's just an integral. I was just like, no, oh my god, it's not just an integral. Like I was adamant, <laughs> like, no, it can't just be that. And he's just, yeah, that's terrible. And he's just then, like, then there's no there's no practical purpose for it in that case. Like, vector fields are things that come up in reality. There's no use for a vector field if it doesn't come up in reality. And you sometimes need to know how that field interacts with an object moving along a curve, and that's very important. Yeah, and uh, but he was in his mathematician bubble, and he's just like, "What's this physical world you speak of?" <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I, I I hate that attitude towards math. That's like the whole uh, like Bertrand Russell approach and all those like rationalistic mathematical people that just they just disconnect math from reality and they make it like they make it just deductions from certain axioms and that's not the best way to do math, I would say. And it's just so disconnected from reality too because you can't you can't learn math that way because you don't know what what the hell is going on. You can't visualize it or connect it to anything whatsoever. Yeah, I, 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 you know what's funny is, is like I used to give all sorts of arguments against people who, who think that way. Um, and I used to get into arguments with them, but it's been so long since I've actually gotten into an argument with someone who's like that, that I can't even like think, I, I actually lost the ability to like th understand where they're coming from. Um, like I, I oh yeah that's that's, that's, that's just that's, that's just me that's I've something been... i noticed that's something i noticed with a lot of um philosophical stuff like if after you integrate something so clearly and you see it so clearly it's hard to like go back and see the other side on things like i noticed that very clearly with uh with egoism and altruism like when somebody's arguing from an altruistic perspective it's like okay but like how is this good for me why why is this good for my life and i'm like no wait they don't care about like they view that as evil they view this as a bad thing i'm like I can't, it's tough to wrap my mind around that sort of thing because at this point it's become like so obvious that the primary goal for me should be to maximize my life and happiness. That's interesting. Cause well, when I was your age, when I was your age or no, actually when I was older than you, I think like, especially when I was about age 22 or so, um, I'd been, uh, well, like, yeah, somewhere around there. I was actually really good. I, I made it a point to like under, to like be able to switch. I actually, one time I played a game 
with some friends of mine at the time. I played this game where I would pretend to be a historical philosopher who held a position other than objectivism, and I would debate with them. Hmm. And I'd been teaching these friends objectivism. And yeah. so in in one of them in one of these little fun dialogues i pretended to be bertrand russell and i spoke with an english accent and everything <laughs> i forget what i was trying to argue but but oh, what man. i would do is is like i would take on this alternate position and one friend of mine in particular thought it was so weird because i would say everything with the confidence i would usually say it only it was the opposite of objectivism <laughs> they'd be i'd be like arguing against cause and effect and they'd just be like I, I, would, I, I have trouble even recalling it now because it's been so long since I've tried to actually, I made a point of being able to shift philosophical contexts early mm. um, because, well, this point is more interesting than the funny little story. But the reason I did that was, the reason I did that was because in philosophy like what a philosophy does is it integrates everything it integrates all of your beliefs so mm -hmm. like one way to test a philosophy is to try it on at least this is what i did when i was young yeah. like i tried it on i said what would happen if i just pretended i viewed it this way and i made a mm -hmm. point of just like saying okay to like i'm gonna really take seriously the idea of being hume or being descartes um and try it on and like what does science look like when you do when you when you attack it from these premises what does uh, ethics look like when you attack it from these premises and like it kind of helps you it helps you see the different philosophies against one another and and what it does yeah. is it helps especially what it does if you know objectivism is correct if you think that you really are certain mm -hmm. like okay this matches with the facts and nothing else does um if you're confident in that, then what this can do is what this this little exercise or this like way of life that I had for a few years, <laughs> like is it it helps you identify when you're actually being inconsistent with objectivism, because you'll find that a lot oh, of times you even though you're not a rationalist, you'll think like a rationalist. Even if you're not an empiricist, you'll sometimes think like an empiricist, and you'll catch yourself doing this if you really know what the explicit premises are and you've tr like taken them to their a logical conclusion in thought and and not in action because they're wrong but like in thought at least in trying to integrate um hmm, yeah for sure i mean yeah and that also like that sort of thing can help give you confidence as well it seems because like if you can understand what the other philosophy is and what you're rejecting about it and like how it actually contradicts reality because you're thinking about it you're thinking about reality in this way and then you see like what the actual roadblocks are for that and where this directly contradicts reality you can overcome that philosophy a lot easier it's not as tempting it's not as it's not as enticing it as if you would if you just rejected it based off a straw man without any real understanding which that's also something that i try to avoid when it comes to like debating people like i like getting out and debating people because i want to hear arguments against objectivism in their strongest form so that i can reject those strongest arguments rather than just listen to like what rand or peacock says their argument is which they I'm, they represent it well i i am a hundred percent in debt to them for the how they how good they can represent these arguments but if i don't engage with them firsthand and hear them from their strongest advocates and hear how that person rationalized their position it doesn't seem like i can refute that position as well and understand what objectivism means as well either because of the whole thing with, that you said with the whole idea of like you know how they think you know how they come to these conclusions and you want to avoid those methodologies when you're coming to objectivism as well yeah and and of course there's also the issue of this is one way to know whether objectivism is even right i, th I wonder if a lot of people they end up ditching objectivism later because it's a fairly as philosophies go it's a fairly popular one like i mean you can just pick up a good book and then discover this whole philosophy and you never knew there was an alternative philosophy. You know, I, I bet there's a lot of people out there where objectivism is the only exposure they have to philosophy whatsoever. And they don't realize that there's alternatives. And so those alternatives actually seep in because they've never seep into their mindset because they say like, oh, well, you know, conservative Christians, 
they're basically objectivists. Like you, they'll, 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 you'll. I think, I think some objectivists will, will, will make mistakes like that because they don't have a very good contrast to draw from. Yeah. So. And it's and at at, at that point, it's really easy to hear good things. Things that like a conservative or a like not non-objectivist would say because there's good things that they say there's good things that people like that come to the conclusion of but if you don't understand like what methodology they used what philosophy they come from it's really hard to reject them on principle it's easy to see superficially that they oh conservatives they generally believe in capitalism more and more away from that over time but they generally believe in capitalism so they're basically on our on our on our side so let's build a big tent and bring everybody in and <laughs> yeah <laughs> As you were saying this, a really scary thought popped into my head. I, I, the, and the thought was this, like, the last time conservatives were talking about capitalism, you were practically in diapers. Like, you were basically a baby back when conservatives, mm. I'm joking, you were like 16. Um, like, I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you I mean, I got, I, got, I got attracted to conservatism initially because... I like listened to like a Steven Crowder video on socialism. That was mm. my first, I like, that was like, I remember like that was the moment that it all changed. That was mm. the moment that I started caring about, of caring about uh, politics. And now like Steven Crowder, I can see how like superficial his positions are and <laughs> yeah. all the problems with his positions. But back then that was like life changing. Like, yo, there's this idea of like freedom and communism is bad. I thought, I mean, all the, all these years I've grown up and it sounded, communism sounded good. I mean, like what, what's, what's the fucking phrase? shit now now, my, now, I'm, now i'm losing it yep from each according to their ability to each according to their yeah. need I'm like that sounds like a good idea in principle um but then i heard and then i heard and i'm like wow this actually like this is terrible this is this is a immoral philosophy and then now he couldn't actually back that up because he just went down un, into altruism after that um but i think i, just, I realized oh, over okay, time yeah, yeah. that that ran, that i needed selfishness and i needed um rand's philosophy and ultimately reason and reality and this whole great philosophy of objectivism that, and it all started with Steven Crowder. Yeah. Thank you, how, Steven how Crowder, you? for converting me to objectivism. <laughs> I think I was a freshman in, in high school. Like I just read 1984, mm. and I was I was like, oh, this 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 is interesting. Like authoritarianism is bad. I get that. And then I thought I thought it was a critique of socialism actually the first time I read it. But George Orwell was actually like a free market socialist type guy, or not not free market socialist. Sorry, libertarian socialist. There's like a do you know, on Instagram named like free market socialist or something like that. So now I, instead of thinking libertarian socialist, I think about that person sometimes, which is all right. But um, yeah, so I, 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 I thought it was a critique of socialism. So then I like looked up socialism. Why is so, why is socialism bad? Is so that somewhat like on YouTube and then the Steven Crowder video came up and then like mm. I was a freshman and this was like life changing stuff. This was stuff I never heard before. Yeah. Huh? God. I, I, I forget how old I was when I read 1984. I want to say I was 12. It scared the crap out of me. No, I think it was like, I was either somewhere between 12 and 14. I was so scared. Like that was the scariest thing. Like, especially the end where it's like, oh yeah, it's like, and Winston spoiler loved alert, spoiler Big alert. Brother. Yeah, spoiler alert. Sorry. Jeez. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and that that I for some reason I thought that was like possible that they could get you to like love some something just by torturing you enough. Um, oh yeah. Well, I mean George Orwell apparently thought it was possible. So. Mm -hmm. And the whole two plus two equals five thing that tripped me out. Like this, he like they're actually getting him to believe this completely contradictory to reality thing, and that like that that just like that was a shocking moment to me. I, that that's like the one part that I think stuck with me. The yeah. whole idea that you can get you to believe contradictions, like co contradictions are contradictory. Like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, you you know what I I I always kind of felt like objectivists did not give George Orwell enough credit. Um, you never hear. I've never heard a single objectivist to speak highly of George Orwell. But like, think about what he did without Ayn Rand. Um, although I mean, he lived around the same time as Ayn Rand, so like he could have had access to her. I think, I think 1984 came out around the same time as Atlas Shrugged did, I think. Um, no, I Atlas say, Shrugged was the like 50s or 60s, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 56, I think. And I think 
1984 uh, was 54, I think. I think it was 48 because it was the opposite. Okay. I remember. I remember. Oh, yeah. is that but it? That, that's, okay, it's I still it was supposed yeah. To be 30 years late. That would yeah. Okay. Okay. But yeah. still, it was around the same time. Like George Orwell mm-hmm. would have been alive oh, yeah. for like Fountainhead. Anyway, but he's still. I don't know. So maybe maybe he doesn't deserve too much credit. But he, <laughs> I think, I think here's a huge thing he does. He identifies a huge epistemological foundation for totalitarianism and that's the idea that the state can even change what's true it's like that's that's what oh, they yeah like he makes this central like on on the surface i mean think about it this way republicans will talk all day long validly but this is as deep as they go well if you pay everyone you know no if you pay everyone regardless of what their job is no one's gonna work you know um, like that's about as deep as they get and it's completely true but it's about as deep as it gets you mm-hmm. know or if you give goods away regard like according to need then you know no one's going to bother having any ability if you get if yeah. your needs are fulfilled without exercising your abilities no one's going to bother working basically yeah that was that was actually my uh my mom's justification against communism when i asked her when i was really little because i i like heard about it and i'm like yo mom communism that doesn't sound very bad but she's like oh nobody would work and then that was basically the justification i thought about it. i'm like yeah that's true i mean communism must be bad then and then i moved on <laughs> it, 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 i had a very similar conversation with my dad yeah um i i i the way i did i asked him as i said why do we have money i said why don't we just give people the things they need and then he explained it and i was just inoculated against stupid economics and politics for the rest of my life just because of that on its own. It, it makes me mm. wonder by what set of mental gymnastics people um, like even fall into leftism. Like it, it kind of just has to be dishonesty on some level, right? Because it's, it's like whatever your moral beliefs are, it's like you can't, at the end of the day, you have to, it, a, an honest leftist will just have to bite the bullet and they'll have to say, look, I know this doesn't work economically, but God told us, or but that's what's right or whatever you know like you yeah, think I mean, they have to bite the bullet <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's kind of that's ultimately how their arguments go like it, the, oh this is unfair this is unequal and then so we got to take from the top and give it to the low or jeff bezos doesn't pay his workers enough so he has to he has to we have to make him pay them more or it's not right that these that these um that these business owners get all the profit when it should actually go to the to the people on the bottom and th- those sort of things and it, it 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 kills capitalism by inches i guess I, I yeah i guess if you string together enough little positions like that which have plausibility oh, yeah. and you're able to like avoid the obvious contradictions i guess eventually you just become a socialist like, yeah i mean and yeah. and fund, fundamentally like it comes from this view of economics being that economics there's these resources out here and then we got to find a way to divvy them up and well, we see in capitalism that all these rich people, it's it, all the all the, all of society's wealth is getting divided towards them more. So shouldn't we try to divide it more equally? But yeah. then completely, completely misunderstanding where that wealth comes from or yeah. why that wealth even comes into existence. <laughs> Co- cookie jar economics. You, your mama gave you 12 cookies. How do we split them up? Well, I guess since we didn't buy the cookies, everyone should just get the same amount. Um, <laughs> so. It, um, oh, yeah. Oh, there was something. I mean, you know what scares me is with this coronavirus thing, you don't hear anyone. You don't hear anyone talking about how bad the economics of the stimulus are. Like you, mm. even Glenn Beck, I, I didn't watch the whole thing, so I could be missing some part of it that's important. But I saw Glenn. You see Glenn Beck on uh, Dave Rubin. Um, I don't watch much Dave Rubin. I mean, I've That's, gotten I've gotten over him. Yeah, I got over him too. But I was <laughs> oh I yeah. was just drinking coffee and just trying to like yeah. start my brain. Oh no, I'm not I'm not not judging not judging it. <laughs> well, you should. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Well, here's nah, the man. I, I watch I watch Destiny Vouch and Nick Fuentes exclusively. So yeah, <laughs> definitely judge me harshly. <laughs> Isn't Nick Fuentes like a? fascist or something or what is oh he? yeah not a fascist. yeah he's terrible i mean he's a, i don't he's, know he's, 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 he's not a he's not really a fascist he's a he's a right-wing mm, pundit right yeah yeah okay. basically like he's, he's pretty much a fascist like he talks okay. about like the jewish question but he dog whistles <laughs> it heavily 
so that like he'll dog whistle he'll dog whistle it so heavily that if you ever press him on he's like oh no i was just talking about how how cookie monster couldn't bake six million cookies in five years (laughs) (laughs) yeah no it's 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 bad like he's 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 so he's so he's so obvious with it and then you just can't call him out you know (laughs) yeah (laughs) you can he just won't fess up to that's that's weird but anyway so glenn beck he um he had a fairly decent statement which was the stimulus makes sense because the government it, at least like on some level because the government asked everyone to stay at home and not do their jobs so it's only reasonable that the government should compensate people for this damage that it did to their economic lives basically um but what's crazy is is that somehow even glenn beck who and i'm not trying to you know, I'm definitely not trying to give some sort of profound compliment to Glenn Beck here, but last time I heard he was a libertarian and libertarians tend to be very well educated in economics. And like, wait a second, Glenn, have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten economics in one lesson? Like, have you forgotten that a stimulus, all a stimulus is, is just throwing a brick through every other store's window. It's basically, you might as well just drive a car down every street in America and throw a brick through every other window and say like, well, there we go. We've stimulated the economy there. Like, <laughs> yeah, it gets the, gets the money circulating. Gets yeah. a, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna boost the glass industry. There you yeah. go. Have you read that book? <laughs> um, I have not, but I've heard, I know, I know that analogy and mm-hmm. I really, I really want to read economics in one lesson. Because yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a solid, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very solid book. Ooh, here's another one. Actually. Have you read the richest man in Babylon? I have not. I've never even heard of that. That, that put that ahead of economics in one lesson because it's it's about personal finance and a lot of it's kind mm. of obvious stuff, but some of it's not. And it kind of like it helps you conceptualize abstract things about how to make money, basically. Like he, he oh. like he taught he talks about there are these two men in Babylon and they're roughly of equal intelligence. They're roughly of equal like value to society and what i'm trying to say there is is they both have jobs that are um they both have jobs that are valued in society like one is a chariot Mm -hmm. maker and then the other i forget what the other one is but they but one of them's incredibly wealthy and the other one is just barely making ends meet and the in the entire reason one is the richest man in babylon and the other one's busting his ass and not getting ahead is because one knows how to manage money and the other one doesn't, basically. And it goes mm. through all these details of like, and the difference it makes. Like, okay, it, like one of the rules is 10% of all you make is yours to keep. And he's trying to say, save 10% at least, basically. And then he shows, he starts yeah. with that. And then all these other rules sort of follow, like invest your wealth, invest your wealth in things that you understand, put your gold to work for you um, so it can make money while you sleep um yeah so there's just it's a really big book for me uh early on in life oh yeah for sure yeah i i've i've always wanted to get into like investing into things but i've never i don't know like anything about it or what to invest in or like what sort i I also have to pay for college too which is a whole a whole nother story Mm. Mm. (laughs) but we'll see i i'm i think i think i should be fine for the next year i haven't taken out a loan yet which is really nice I've, I've, I'm one of the lucky ones. I got a big scholarship for my college. And then now I don't have to take out that many loans and I can save a lot more of my money. And with the Corona thing, they refunded like all of our room and board, but so, or just like the, the what was left basically. I think they actually, it was probably like 60% of what was left or something like that. So I, I ha- got like an extra cushion, but I've, I haven't been saving it as much as I wanted to. I've been buying a bunch of books basically. <laughs> well, never skimp on books. Don't, don't. Oh, yeah, if these are sure. books that <laughs> if these are if these are books so you can you know see them on your shelf and go yeah then that's one yeah. thing don't buy those but if you're reading them they're worth it another yeah. thing I, I just I yeah. think I think I have a problem with buying way too many books though because I have because you don't read like them if all. you've seen my shelf it's full mm-hmm. but I'm like I read like 10 pages a day and I don't I'm not getting through those books for at least a couple of years so but we'll see someday my policy is books in on average books are cheap in comparison to 
the benefit you gain from them. So at least yeah. for me, I just buy it. I, I have some, I have quite a few books I haven't read yet or like a lot of books I've read like a couple pages of. Um, mm-hmm. But even, but there's always a reason I stop. It's, it's never, if it's, it's a lot of times like you feel like, oh, I got to finish this whole book. It's not always the case. Sometimes you, sometimes like the reason that you're feeling like you aren't interested is because there's nothing more for you to gain from the book. Uh, there's no, sure. there's no rule that says you got to finish every book that you read. Yeah. I kind of treat yeah. books like a Marine treats bullets. Like it's just, it's just hmm. fuel for the fire. It's just ammunition. It's just more <laughs> like a lot of people like, you're like, Oh, like, look at all these like beautiful books. Like, Oh, it's like, this is, I don't know for me. It's, this is, this is fuel. This is ammo. Like, yeah, it's kind of there. Yeah. <laughs> I have a different attitude towards them. I think it's like, yeah. I just have them on my shelf ready. Like, Oh wait, what was that one thing I remember? And then I take it off the shelf and I, and like, okay, yeah, that. Okay. And then, and it, they're just there yeah. for me to use later. <laughs> like that's yeah, the sort of sure. thing. There, it's it's yeah, almost I, like not sentimental to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've noticed with like I used to not read as much as I would like to, and I would like I would go weeks, months without reading, and I would like oh then now I'm gonna read like 200 pages today, and then I'd get through like I'd finish Atlas Shrugged. That that's basically how I finished Atlas Shrugged. I would I had it on the shelf, and I got I would do like these I would I would binge read basically. I'd read like 200 pages and then put it down. 200 pages, put it down. 200 pages, put it down. And then I guess not. And, and then this new year, I got into a habit of trying to read like 10 pages a day. And I've started to struggle with that. But now I'm starting to like read a lot more analytically where I'm like underlining things in the book. And that's that's actually helped quite a bit. Like it makes it a lot more manageable because then then I'm like, I'm not just like skimming the words and trying to comprehend it. I'm like searching. It feels like I'm searching for good quotes or searching for the essential. And that's like that. It's a lot more goal directed. And it's a lot more, yeah, it feels a lot more focused and it's a lot easier to get through, I think. Now, why read 10 pages a day? Why, why set a goal of reading a certain amount? Um, just so that I can like actually do it so that I'm not just like setting the book down for months and then like waiting two months to read, do, do that whole like binge reading thing still so that I can just get in the habit of getting through books and I mean, that that's valuable because I want to read more books. And when, like, I feel like, like, I've just noticed that when I, when I read a book, it gain, it gives me so much more knowledge than like watching a bunch of YouTube videos or courses on the same subject. So like, after I read ITOE, like I noticed my ability to talk about epistemology greatly improved, it improved drastically. And even just like, I just started uh, capitalism, the unknown ideal, but I feel like so much clearer on political issues just from like the first, first couple pages of, of those uh, essays. Right. I, something I'm realizing is, is that my, my needs are very, very unusual and very, very specific. Like I'm, you know, I have a research project. That's, that's what you're trying to learn. You're trying to just grow your mind generally whereas like i'm i'm settled yeah. into a track and just have a mission that's why i treat i mean i don't think i really explain that that's why i treat books like ammunition it's a, it like i have a certain i'm not hmm. just learning kind of in every direction anymore like i'm on a specific mission and so the books aren't books for me are no longer this growth process like they, they are that but mainly they are resource a resource towards hmm a specific goal. And when I read, there's always a specific goal in mind. I'm never just kind of reading just to read there. It's always like, yeah. it's always with a specific, I need to know this now for this purpose to get to like advance my project forward. Um, mm. So yeah, yeah, I, I I mean, guess... yeah, there's nothing wrong with the other way of doing it where you just are <laughs> learning just to grow as a person. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing wrong. It's just yeah. not, it's just not what I'm doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess part of it for me is just learning like like I'll 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 open a book and I'll, I'll think, oh, this is this has a good philosophical principle or a good general philosophy or put or like an interesting way of thinking because I don't only read objectivist books like I want to read a bunch of other stuff that I find to might be influential or might be interesting to learn about just to see like how different people think about things and how different philosophers come to certain ideas. 
and compare that to my methodology and compare that to Rand's methodology ultimately as that standard because that's like that's the one that I found through my introspection and through my looking for different philosophers. Um, I found her methodology to be the best. And now I want to sort of refine that and see how it compares to other philosophers and see how like where I can go wrong or those, those sort of things as well. So I guess that that that's sort of my goal going into books is to see essential principles and philosophical methods of thinking. You know what you might consider doing? I mean, at some point is going through the history of philosophy. Mm, um, yeah, I've that I, I I listened to like some of Peacock's courses, but I think I I don't know why I stopped. I think I was listening to them at the end of my senior year mm, in high school, mm. and I would just because I would have like a study hall every every morning. And I would just sit in there and just li- listen, listen to the, dude, listen to those lectures. Dude, then, I wish I was listening to Leonard Peikoff's History of Philosophy when I was eighteen. <laughs> Man, yeah. And then, and then after after that study hall, like after the study hall thing got done, then I just stopped with that course. I should probably get back on that. I don't listen to that many it, courses. It which really is, depends on your needs. Really just but but based on what you were saying, I was just thinking that might help you. Like yeah, ultimately, sure. yeah. I mean, you know, I don't exactly see you slacking off. So, you know, um, <laughs> you know, like it's just a suggestion. Yeah. Use, use your own judgment. But that course made a huge difference to me. Like that's, I mean, that course is what got me into um, the ability to sort of shift perspectives. Cause every time we went through another philosopher, I really asked, what did I ask? It's a very particular question. I imagined what it would be like to be that person who, th- and, and then, and then what would you have to, what would you have to think in order to integrate the world in the way this person did? That's like, mm. that was really the question I kept asking every single time. And I, and at, like every single time with every philosopher, um, up until, up until everyone after Kant, I even understood how it would like, what it would be like to, to integrate the way Kant did. Um, mm-hmm. Or like, or on some level I, I did anyway. And, but it, like, I was able to say like, Oh, okay. Like, yeah, that's, I could see why they would do that. Like I could see how they would do that. Like that's, mm-hmm. I can see, you know, why you'd integrate the world that way. Um, there's a kind of a reason they were trying to answer certain questions and, uh, you know, like, um, oh, we have some, can you still hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I think, I think I cut out for a moment. Um, yeah, they were trying to answer certain questions and that, that really do come up in life and seeing the whole range of answers really helped, like I was saying before. So, um, yeah yeah for sure i i think a lot a lot of the times when i hear about the philosophers presented in that course or when i heard about them i would think oh liveness he believes in like monads and what does that even mean (laughs) just dismiss dismiss immediately and (laughs) maybe that maybe not that might not be the best approach to that i don't remember thinking that that made sense (laughs) that everything's a monad well actually no actually no i do remember i do remember thinking that that made sense because he was on this, ra- he had a rationalist epistemology and he was hungry for knowledge. Yep. And so he, he just deduced his way. He just followed these rationalistic <laughs> deductions and he's like, and I, I could really imagine what that would be like. He's just, okay, this is how you figure things out. Reasons how you figure things out. Let's do this baby. And you just start making deductions and then like, okay, well, everything's made out of insold atoms. I, it's weird, but that's what re, that's what the reason tells us. So that's what you got to go with. <laughs> oh yeah, it feels it feels like in some of these contexts, you can just rationalize just about anything you could, you yeah. possibly want to, just by like conflating things that feel similar, or or like saying, oh, I use the word the here instead of an, and what what does that mean? What is the difference between the and and? Well, just fucking use and then if if you're so confused about it. Like, good lord, it's a, it's the same thing. But yeah, it's like just this yeah, you can do all sorts of crazy shit with or crazy stuff with rationalization. Got to tone down the vulgarity. What's that? I got 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 to got to tone down the vulgarity. I, yeah, I'm, yeah. Charles, the ghost of Charles will come and get you. <laughs> 
So uh, we were going to talk about Zeno's paradox. Um, did you want to try and talk about that? We'll see if my brain can handle it right now. Do you want to do you want to test and see if my brain is warmed up now? Oh, yeah, let's 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 jump into it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a basic summary of Zeno's paradox or the one there's a bunch of different ones or there's two that I've heard of. Mm -hmm. There's the whole like idea of like, oh, there's two distances, half, half, half. That's the one that I presented in my video on it. But the one that Pat Corvini uses is the idea of like Achilles starts and then there's a tortoise that he's chasing. Well, the tortoise doesn't move as fast as Achilles does. So then Achilles has the time to get to here. But by the time he gets there, well, the tortoise has already moved a little bit. And then he keeps doing that and the tortoise has already moved and, and he can never actually catch the tortoise uh, according to the paradox. And basically Pat Corvini lays out a syllogism for it, which I actually have written down because mm. I, I wrote it down so that we could plan or so that I could plan out that. Actually, before you Let's deliver Corvini's, this is, this would be really interesting before you deliver Corvini's, um, syllogism though let's uh let's really make this a paradox clear for the audience because um yeah for sure <laughs> it's not so well the the, the, yeah. the, sil the syllogism is just like i i was going to use that to sort of clarify like what oh to clarify the paradox yeah. it's not her solution yeah, yeah. it's it's her yeah. oh no just just her, just the just the yeah yeah so the, the first premise is obviously like achilles must complete an infinite number of divisions or she uses divisions as like distances traveled so mm -hmm. like this would be a division mm -hmm. and um and then premise two would just be Achilles cannot complete an infinite number of, of divisions and therefore he cannot catch the tortoise because there, you, he, he would have to complete an infinite number of steps in this and he can't do that. So how can he catch the tortoise? That's definitely and, a solid thing to essentialize. Let's, let's make sure the audience can understand the, 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 the paradox itself though. So, so the idea is this is something the philosopher Zeno came up with because he didn't mm -hmm. think that Zeno didn't think motion was possible. He had particular philosophical reasons for th for thinking motion was impossible, but we won't go into that. And so here's one of his arguments it, against motion. Zeno said that. Wait, Zeno said there's no such thing as change. He got wrecked. Exactly. Wait, shit, yeah. Is that the right one? But we know yeah, that he right invented line, the debate or dialectic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yep, <laughs> I yep. almost have that whole song memorized. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I still listen to that song. Like I still listen to that. Oh song yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but anyway, okay, so so Zeno, um, <clears throat> what? So here's his argument against motion. He says, "Imagine, imagine the uh, fastest man in the world, Achilles, is in a race against a tortoise, and the tortoise, mm -hmm. but the tortoise gets a head start. Okay, yep. In order to catch up with the tortoise, Achilles must first reach the starting position of the tortoise. Yep." But by the time he does so, the tortoise has moved on. The tortoise is, you know, maybe if the tortoise got like maybe a hundred meter head start, by the time Achilles gets there, maybe the tortoise has gone two meters, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. Achilles has two more meters to go. Okay, fine. So Achilles crosses the two meters. But by the time Achilles has crossed the two meters, the tortoise has crossed about four centimeters maybe. Okay, well, whatever. Achilles can just go the next four centimeters. Okay, but uh, during that time, the tortoise moved on again, maybe eight. I don't know. I'm losing track, but some small amount, amount of distance. So the idea is, is every time Achilles catches up, there's still a little bit more to go. So Achilles can never catch the tortoise. And so, okay, so now, mm -hmm. now read the syllogism. This is like the very, yeah. so oh, now yeah. that you yeah, have yeah. that in image in, in your head, dear audience, Think about this syllogism and you could see where Zeno is trying to attack the idea that motion is, is possible at all. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, basically the first premise would be Achilles cannot complete or must complete an infinite number of divisions or steps to catch the tortoise. Premise two, Achilles cannot complete an infinite number of divisions. Conclusion, Achilles cannot catch the tortoise. Yeah. And, and um, I think, yeah, Zeno's ultimate goal was this, like the whole, the questions that they were uh, talking about in, in, uh, well, one of the one of the big questions that they were talking about in ancient Greece was this idea of multiplicity. Like, how can you have a multitude of things that are like changing and doing all these sort of things when the universe is like this one big thing? Sort yeah. Of. Um, and that his 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 idea was like, oh no, there's no multiplicity. There's no change. There's no none of this. The universe is just this solid block of just pure oneness. <laughs> yeah. And 
And yeah. this, this, this was an attempt to justify it. And it was sort of, he would, he was basically saying that your means of perception, you perceive the world wrong, you, but the, you see multiplicity as an illusion. The mm-hmm. real reality is just this block of oneness, basically. Yeah. So this is going to sound a little crazy and this is sort of a teaser to my audience, but I think there, I, I suspect that there's a sense in which Zeno and Parmenides are correct about this. That the universe is hmm. that that like I think they're noticing s- something like here's what it is is like I I think Par- Parmenides says change can't happen. Parmenides was yeah. Zeno was defending Parmenides' position. Parmenides yeah. was the first guy to say like I think the universe is just one giant slab of undifferentiated matter. It's just a it's just a block like as you said. Uh-huh. Um, Z- so one thing Zeno said there can't be, or rather uh, Parmenides said there can't be change because he says change involves a contradiction. You can't have something just change into something else. Mm-hmm. That's true. I think that's basic. I think that's true. You can't just have something become what it isn't. What you can have oh, that is, true. is the rear, what, what, what we, what, and then, but Democritus figured out how, but that doesn't mean you can't have change. I'm not against, I'm not pro Parmenides. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. Change sure. happens. What Democritus showed, or what, Democritus had a hypothesis that everything's made of atoms and that the atoms don't change because the atoms are what they are. They can't just become what they mm-hmm. aren't, but the atoms rearrange yep. themselves. So I think, the, I think the general premise to draw from this, this is just a hypothesis that I'm playing with as I'm mm-hmm. working on physics on the, on the highest levels or like when I think about what happens after relativity, after quantum mechanics, I'm th- as I think about certain ways of in- to integrate these fields in a rational way, one of the things we have to think about is this metaphysical fact that if something change changes, it w- this is just a hypothesis. If something changes, it means its constituents are changing their relationships with respect to one another. The ultimate yeah. constituents can't change because they mm-hmm. are what they are. I think Z- I think Parmenides was getting that right. Yeah, and, but and in fact, they they, they went yeah. they go too far though when they yeah. say like because they also had this assumption that things can't move and can't change in relation to one another. Yeah. based on like oh because if it moves here that would imply that there was nothing here before or some, uh-huh. so, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. So what that, that that's, was that's a step what, obviously too far. Well, so okay, so Parmenides, this is actually this is something else like Parmen. So I think Parmenides was onto something here. He took it too far, or the way I would put it, I know this sounds kind of wacky. I have to emphasize, this is a hypothesis. Like, or this is just some, uh, it's, it's not even a hypothesis. It's like a fruitful metaphysical idea that might help us in physics at some point. So, hmm. um, so here's, what Parmenides, here's why Parmenides and then Zeno as a result thought that motion, there wasn't motion. Because he says, okay, there is no nothing. Yeah. Nothing is not a thing. So imagine, imagine if you're at the North Pole and then you go up, you know, uh, 10,000 miles. You might, you might ask, what's there? What's at that location? You might say, well, nothing's at that location. Well, wait a second, buddy. Nothing ain't a thing. Nothing is not a thing that exists. Yep. There is no nothing. Mm-hmm. There has to be something there. There has to be something there, says Parmenides. I think he's right. I think you, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so Parmenides says there's something everywhere. There has to be something everywhere. If there wasn't something there, it wouldn't be aware. It wouldn't be a thing. So it's just everything is something. Everything that is is something. So Parmenides says from this, the world therefore has to be solidly packed. As a result, nothing can move. Because everything's just locked in place. If if and and as you were saying, like, if something moves, what is it moving into? Well, there's just more stuff here. So, well, like, it it can't actually move. So things can't move. Yeah, but like we certainly I think that's see them wrong. move, and it seems that they're like sliding sliding next to each other and stuff. Like, what what about sliding into each other, or just like sliding by each other? Those sort of things, like. But what allows them to, sl- like, maybe they're elastic is what you're saying. Who said maybe the, all the objects are elastic? <laughs> the thing is, is this doesn't make sense. Like, I'm not saying that this yeah. is an act. I think the thing he's getting right is that there is no nothing. 
And yeah, as a result, sure. everywhere has to have something in it. Yeah, but then obviously not everything is solid, of course. Like, things can move Yeah, well, here's the other. thing. I think it's silly to speculate about w how it is the case that everything is something, yet motion oh, yeah, is possible. Sure. You don't have to stipulate that, you know, like, air is squishy, and therefore you can kind of, like, squeeze past it <laughs> or something. You, this is yeah. all physical speculation that requires actual physical experiments which Z like parmenides didn't have the right to like say anything about because he didn't have the information but yeah on the sure. sheerly metaphysical level i think this tells us something in physics that it, like there is something everywhere um yeah for sure for so sure. like mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's what got this whole thing started for how there wasn't any motion. So Zeno was trying to defend <laughs> Parmenides there. Yeah. So anyway, where were we on Zeno? On Antis um, Paradox. Motion's impossible. Uh, I think we laid, we, laid out, we, laid out the, we laid out the premises, basically. Yeah. And I, we were just explaining like what his ultimate goal was. Um, yeah. Was to basically argue against multiplicity and change and those sort yeah. of things. Do you happen um, to remember why he was against multiplicity? Uh, because everything is one. Like, uh, there's no separation between anything, so everything is just one thing. Because, well, what was his argument for saying that everything is one thing? Because if it's all tightly packed together, it's all just one thing. Like, everything is just glued together. Everything is one entity. Why can't it just be a bunch of different entities glued together? Parmenides was smarter than that. Like, he had to have had an argument against that. I, I'm sure. I'm sure he did. I don't, I'm not. I'm not a par Parmenidean scholar. Right. I, yeah, anyway, yeah, I, that's something I'd want to know because, like, anyway, let's let's go on with Zeno's paradox. I'm starting to think about all of these things that I kind of have cooking, but they're not they're not done yet. Don't take them out of the oven. Yeah, for sure. Well, then, um, I guess we we can go into like each each of the premises and how to debunk them. But I mean, historically what pa or the, basically Pat Gorvini argues like historically the thing that people got wrong is they would reject just one of the premises without rejecting the other that was the thing that she would talk about so some people would say oh um so Achilles must complete an infinite number of divisions to catch the tortoise well some people would reject that first premise and say no Achilles doesn't have to complete an infinite infinite number of divisions to catch the tortoise so then premise two doesn't matter because yeah of course of course Achilles can't complete an infinite number of divisions um so then the conclusion is absurd. Achilles obviously can catch the tortoise now. So well, then other other philosophers would basically um, reject the second premise while adhering to the first, basically. So they're mm -hmm. like, oh, Achilles can complete an infinite num number of divisions, and he does have to, but he can do it, so it's fine. And then right. hence so, the conclusion is false. Yeah, so, so yeah, those are the two ways people have historically argued against Zeno's paradox. Now, what's interesting about Zeno's paradox is not whether motion... No one, no one's actually entertaining the idea that motion is impossible. Well, I mean, probably some a-holes are, but, like, skeptics out there are. But, like, the idea is, is that this teach... If Whenever you come across something in in any realm that doesn't seem to integrate, it mean, that, that it doesn't... Your ideas don't seem to fit together, like this idea of motion and this idea of subdividing distances, like if you come across a contradiction, it means there's something to be learned from sorting out the contradiction. Even if the contradiction isn't something that seems like it needs to be sorted out, like, you know, I have no problem going on a bike ride tomorrow morning, you know, if I don't have Zeno's paradox solved. I'm like, oh, I would go outside and ride my bike, but I, but I can't move. So, yeah. you know, like, it, not, that's not what's going to happen. The thing that makes this interesting, it's sort of like you had a discussion with Dan Norton and you were talking about, yeah. like, is life, what was it, is the standard, or hold on, is the choice to live arbitrary or not? Yep. That question is interesting to me, not because, like, if I don't have an answer, I'm just going to sit here and not value my life. Like, oh, it's arbitrary, so I guess I won't value my life. What's interesting mm -hmm. about it is, is, like, it's a little hiccup in your knowledge. It's like, hmm, like, it seems like we don't have an answer to this. Like, is it really arbitrary? Like, is that really... I don't think it is, yeah. by the way. Or it's like arbitrary. Oh yeah, is not the I don't right think it word. is either. Arbitrary is not the right word to apply to the situation. Yeah, incidentally. yeah, for sure. But but anyways, this is what makes these things interesting. Is is like you you see a little contradiction in your knowledge state, and it means that if you sort it out, you'll learn something, probably on a very deep level too. So anyway, um, mm -hmm. 
how would people in what specific way would people deny the first premise that achilles must complete an infinite number of divisions what sort of specific argument would people levy to that effect uh i don't i can uh, think of I, one i, can, I, can, I don't know if it's i actual... can imagine i can imagine the type of arguments that people would make i guess they would they would sort of have to i mean they would they would sort of have to argue that like hmm it just gets like so small that it doesn't matter anymore basically that's 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 that's, that's I mean that's 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 similar to the sort of argument that Corvini makes in the physical context. So when you focus on it in the physical context, like you understand that it gets to this point where like it gets so small, so small of a separation that it just is indistinguishable at that point, and he can pass him. Right. I I'm. I mean, I'll tell you. There's this. There is one. I think this is Steve Patterson's view. By the way, um, you ever heard of Steve Patterson? Um, I recognize the name, but I don't like recognize, I don't, I can't put a face or anything. He's another YouTube philosopher. He's about my age, um, maybe a little older. Um, and he goes after Zine. He's a rationalist. He also, I don't respect him that much because he doesn't think Rand is very important. Um, Mm. yet he writes a book, which is completely redundant, uh, when compared against the first couple pages of Opar. Um, hmm. Like he, uh, he writes this whole book about the axiom, like the axiom of identity. Anyway, I'm not going to go into Steve Patterson. I'm totally drifting because mm. I'm so tired. So, um, <laughs> um, Steve Patterson basically says, he says, Achilles clearly motion is possible. As a result, it must be the case that Achilles is not actually completing an infinite number of divisions. So it must be the case that space is um quantized space is discrete space comes Uh, in chunks like you can like let's say you zoom in a bunch and so it's like you can go let's just say a billion let's think about a billionth of a meter you can go a billionth of a meter but you can't go half of a billionth of a meter you can go a billionth of a meter or not go at all if space yeah. was like kind of if the unit of space was a billionth of a meter or whatever it was, that's what Steve mm-hmm. is saying. He's saying it's got to like space has to be discrete in this way. And Zeno's paradox shows us that space has to be discrete. That's one way that people deal with Zeno's paradox is they say, hey, it actually teaches us that space has to be discrete. And people who think this are actually mm-hmm. against the use of infinity in mathematics because they'll say, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, they'll say like the square root of two, it goes on forever, right? Like there's an infinite number of divisions implied by the square root of two because you can keep the decimals going. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should explain what that means. I'll explain what that means later. So so as a result, they're against infinities in mathematics. And and, uh, there was this mathematician I liked. You ever heard of uh, Norman Wildberger? Nope. He's, he's a cool mathematician. I mean, he's, he's wrong about everything he's original on. Like, he's against infinities. <laughs> but I like him because he, he's adamant about it. He says, hey, this doesn't, infinity doesn't make sense. People just keep using it blindly without thinking about it, as though it does. Um, stop using infinity, guys. And he's trying to come up with all the, like a reformulation of mathematics without infinities, including yeah, how can how, how can you do calculus with that? You got me there. <laughs> yeah. I ha- I'm working on a way of no, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that. Um so uh um yeah, and then the se- the second type of person, I guess. Yeah, it's, what's the it's just the type? idea that like oh, they can complete an infinite number of divisions. Like they do ultimately do that. I don't know I mean, that would be sort of a Cantorian approach where it's like infinity is a re- if infinity exists, you just mm. bite the bullet and you just say, hey, infinity. exists." Oh, yeah. Is that is that what they do? Yeah. And it sort of it sort of implies that it exists in the real world as well, which is obviously not. Not true. Yeah. Well, like if it. Well, it's 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 sort of it sort of is a like as as Corvini describes it, it's sort of a conflation of the abstract with the concrete like you you conflate this abstract 
this abstract idea of what infinity is with this concrete scenario. But I guess we should kind of explain how she solves the paradox before we get into like how she specifically defines it. Defines what? Or how she explains like what the paradox is or why, why people make that mistake. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's talk. So, so you've got people who say, who solve the problem by saying that space is discretized, that space comes mm -hmm. in chunks. And so, but then you, then you, um, but then you run into this Norman Wildberger situation slash Steve Patterson situation where you don't want infinity in mathematics. You reject the idea yeah. of an irrational number, for example, that has an infinite decimal expansion. Um, you're against pi apparently. Uh, cause pi goes on an infinite number of decimal oh, yeah. places. So like, w l and then, and then apparently you reject calculus or you have to like radically reformat it because calculus, you know, treats some finite quantity as being split into an infinite number of pieces. So mm -hmm. what the hell? And then on the other hand, you have an, uh, an apparently equally irrational, or like, I don't know, that sounds pretty rational. In co to me, that sounds pretty rational in comparison to the alternative where you have actual infinities, where you just say like, yeah, hell yeah. He completes an infinite number of divisions. What of it? Infinity's a real thing. Like, you know, you, I mean, that sounds like a disaster to me. So, oh, yeah, so how sure. does Corvini, so, so I don't know if Corvini presents the dichotomy that way. I don't remember what she says. I don't want to misrepresent her. Yeah, I mean that's that's, I mean that's essentially like I I just sort of explained like the principles. I don't know if she represents it in the in those sort of uh, concrete forms, but I think those are good, um, good concrete examples of those 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 formulations of rejecting it. And ultimately, what Corvini does is she says that basically, like the first approach where you reject the first premise, that's true in the physical case. In the in like the when you. Uh, look at what the physical race actually is. It is, the first premise is false. The idea that um, that Achilles needs to complete an infinite number of divisions. And her explanation for this is basically um, that, like let's, let's imagine that it's a sand track, for example. That's the example that she gives. And so this is Corvini's you, solution you're telling us right now. Yeah to, the, yeah, to the physical example. And then she later does the mathematical, or for the mathematical abstraction where she basically, um, what was it? She will do the no, wait, physical. I'm, I'm getting, example. I'm getting it backwards. I'm getting it backwards. I'm getting it backwards. The, for, okay. for the for the first, wait, hold up. No, okay, yeah, the 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 the, the mathematical abstraction one is the second premise. Um, she rejects that one in, in or no, yeah, she, yeah, she says that Achilles can complete an infinite number of divisions in a mathematical abstract sense not in the physical world sense. And the problem comes when you conflate the two and create this paradox. So Okay, that sounds right to me. See, you know what's funny is, is I'm too tired to remember exactly what her solution is. It's been years since I focused yeah. on this, unfortunately. Um, but we'll see if this, <laughs> anyway, so this is, yeah, this let's, is, let's see if we can, let's see if you can teach it to me right now. How about that? <laughs> let's see if you can reteach yeah, me Pat Corvini's solution. That sounded right, what you just said. Yeah, let's do it. So, <laughs> I mean, basically, basically the idea is, um, let's say, let's say they're racing on a sand track, for example, mm -hmm. like Achilles mm -hmm. versus the tortoise. Mm -hmm. um, when Achilles, eventually, there's going to be a point where, well, basically, Achilles will catch will catch the tortoise the first time. The tortoise will move on. Achilles catch, tortoise moves on, and eventually there becomes a point. Like let's say, let's say you're measuring the distance between the two by sticking pins in the sand track. Mm -hmm. measuring the distance between them mm -hmm. and after each interval after each like motion you stick you stick new pins in and eventually there's going to get to a point where it becomes so small that you have to choose one side of an individual grain of sand to place mm -hmm. the pin on mm -hmm. and at that point the the pins will be at the exact same point they will be indistinguishable from each other um or one would be ahead of the other you'd have to choose Oh yeah, oh, for no, sure. No, but eventually, right. no, eventually, eventually, you'd have to get to a point where they're at the, at the exact same yeah, spot. Right. And right. now, like, you could ask, like, oh, but what if you like have a super zoomed-in camera? Like, you could still see, even in that example, that that the tortoise is like the last inch of its nail is hanging over. Well, then you keep going, and eventually, that that's camera. It has a, it has a limit to its, um, 
to the precision with which it can measure it. Mm -hmm. And there will, all, there will always be that limit. So every single physical example, there's going to be a point where the, the difference between the two is indistinguishable. And that's the point where we say that Achilles has caught the tortoise in the physical example, because there is no difference. There's no distinguishable, distinguishable difference between the position of the tortoise and Achilles. And now, so my initial thought when I heard this was, is this conflated? Wait, this sounds like it's conflating metaphysics and epistemology here. So before and we go there, that's a really important point. So maybe write that down so that we come to that. But I want to make yeah. sure the audience is going to understand this. Because um, sure. this whole idea of like, is it is, is Corvini con 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 conflating the metaphysical and the epistemological? Like, I think that's really important to understand what it is she's saying. So... Mm -hmm. So what? Sh so like, let's make sure. So, let's imagine at each interval, like when Achilles catches the tortoise, catches the tortoise's original position. You put a pin right there at Achilles's position, and you put a pin at the tortoise's position. Mm -hmm. Then you let the then you let Achilles uh, run up to the next pin, the the, the tortoise yeah. pin, and you put a new pin in for the tortoise's new location. Mm -hmm. Then you let, so eventually if you, and then, and then you keep repeating yep. this and the pins will keep getting closer together as you do this, but eventually you won't be able to actually put one pin out ahead of the other, because in order to do that, you'd mm -hmm. have to stab your pin into the center of a grain of sand, which you can't do. So what, what, yep. what Corvini is trying to say with this sand, this grain of sand thing is she's saying that the, these pins are a system of measurement. There's a particular standard of measurement. Mm -hmm. And by that standard of measurement, you cannot differentiate distances any finer than a grain of sand. And then what you're saying, Garrett, is that eventually, well, maybe, okay, well, maybe you use a camera because, you know, yeah. maybe, a, maybe the tortoise is still half a grain of sand out ahead of Achilles at a certain point mm -hmm. in the race. So, you, okay, well, now you just use a camera to figure out whose nose is ahead of whose, you know? Um, yep. And, but then at some point, you're going to run into the width of the individual wavelengths of light that you're, that's coming from the tip of the tortoise's nose and the tip of Achilles' nose. And you won't be able yep. to tell within that measurement, f like, exactness. So, now, mm -hmm. okay, so now why did you think that this... What made you think this was equating the metaphysical and the epistemological here? Um, I guess initially when I hear when I heard this, I thought, well, like still metaphysically, regardless of how we can measure it, Achilles is still behind the tortoise in all these examples, even this inf infinitesimal distance, Achilles would still be behind. But then I guess the whole process of dividing distances up is something that is entirely invented through epistemology it's entirely invented by man by a human being to see the distance between the two to, to distinguish the distance between the two the metaphysics just is what it is achilles is where he is the tortoise is where he is the track is what it is the distance between the two is impossible without epistemology without a method of measurement and that method of measurement will always have some resolution limit isn't the distance between the two racers, isn't, doesn't that have an identity? Isn't that what it is? That's a metaphysical, like the, the, the degree to which, um, you know, the tortoise mm. is beating Achilles still. That's a metaphysical fact. So that's sure, not, we the, still you, you were, you were saying that that distance is epistemological. But but like the yeah distance or the measurement the two, of that distance the ability to distinguish the distance between the two yeah it's not now why does that matter though because that's the whole point of what we're doing here we're trying to distinguish the distance between the two people we're trying to or it's between Achilles and the tortoise that yeah. that's the whole point of what we're doing in that instance is distinguishing the distance between the two of them so I'm gonna be devil's advocate here we'll see if we can. See if we really understand, uh, you know, Corvini's position here. Or find out if it's even right. Yeah. And another, another interesting thing that I've thought about with relating in relating this, like there's like there's, there's two measurements that are sort of going on here. There's obviously the measurement of distance that we're actually measuring. 
and there's that measurement of time as well and we know that the human eye like we can only see a certain we can only perceive a certain amount of time in that perspective and and we see that as the as like they're getting closer and closer the actual time interval that it takes for them to move is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and eventually like the next movement all the, all these smaller distances will be so small and the sum of what the rest of it would be all the way to infinity the sum of all those all those times would be so small that we can't even see it it'd just be split second and it'd be done the reason okay so the reason this gets brought up is to ensure against the process taking an infinite amount of time yeah so you one one argument against uh, one one argument that you could put on Zeno's side is is you're like oh yeah absolutely motion is impossible because it would take Achilles an infinite amount of time to complete an infinite number of actions Achilles has to cross an infinite number of distances wouldn't that take literally forever but then Aristotle mm-hmm. says no cuz each each action takes half the or like you know some fraction of the amount of time yep. the previous action does so it so like that part of the paradox gets solved pretty easily um mm-hmm. well i don't know it's easy once aristotle said it so however easy that is you know so that, that <laughs> we, we know the solution to that part so it's not a problem because of that so it doesn't take an infinite amount of time the question is is how do you do an infinite number of things but I think, I think what Corvini is saying is, is it's not actually an infinite number of things. The only thing that makes it, the only, the only reason it looks like an infinite number of things let me is because we're better, dividing it in an infinite way. Is because you could conceive of dividing it yeah. as many times as you'd like. You can't divide it in an mm-hmm. infinite number of, you can't actually divide it an infinite number of times. You may divide it as many times as you'd like, you can't divide it yep. an infinite number of times. And, and that's kind of her point. She's saying that like considering considering the divisions, you, when you consider the number of divisions, you will always consider some number of divisions. You will always be yep. using some standard with some finite amount of resolution. Yep. And, and once you do that, there will be a moment where Achilles is behind the tortoise one moment and he's in front of the tortoise the next moment because you picked some sort of chunk. You picked some sort of division. You picked some sort of chunk. He's behind the tortoise one moment and then he's ahead and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's now you could say, Oh, but we could divide again. And then like, then there's a bunch of gradations of when he's behind and when, okay. Yeah. But then once you pick that smaller division, there will be a division at which he's behind and then he and then the next division he's ahead. And that's all there in, is to it. In, or, in every well, particular case, there is a limit. And every like you can you can abstract away and say that, oh, but you can always pick a different one. And you can but and you can always um, there's no actual limit to or there's no like inherent limit to that. uh to the amount of precision that you can have on that on that distance but in every particular case there is one there is a limit and if you if you're familiar with Rand's theory of concepts i think this is starting to like like ring some bells in your head because the whole idea of like a a point that Rand makes a lot in her theory of concepts is like when you have a measurement or when you have a particular thing it has measurements but the abstraction all the measurements are omitted in reality it must have a particular measurement, but in the con- conceptual form, it's just the measurements are omitted. So the same theory of concepts applies to this process, to this um, infinite division process, or I shouldn't say infinite yet because we haven't defined that. But this is how you define it's some. An infinite it's process. not an infinite number of divisions. It's some, but any divisions. Yep. It's yep. some. Uh, it's some size of division, but it can be any size div- of division. Yep. And then basically when we form this concept, we form this concept of this type of um, division uh, sequence of divisions, we omit the measurement of our measurement, basically of our measurement method. <laughs> I, yeah. I like that phrase. So I wanted to get it. Yeah. In. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was making <laughs> so sure like, you got to say that. <laughs> yeah. I saw you write it down on our notes before. <laughs> oh yeah. Say, for sure. say it again. I'm sorry. I ruined it for you. Yeah. So, so you like you have to omit omit the measurements of the specific way of measuring things. Omit a measurement of a measurement. So, there's a specific measurement 
of your method of measurement, which is basically like your camera, for example, there's a certain limit to its uh, to its uh, resolution with the sand with the uh, pins in the sand. There's a certain limit to the resolution of those things of that form of measurement as well. So there's all these different forms or these are there's all these different. Um, um, what are they called uh, resolution limits? And when you form the concept of measuring this, these sort of things and forming this uh, infinite divisibility uh, sort of sequence, you omit that measurement. You omit the measurement of, of the resolution limit. And then you have this sort of open-ended resolution limit, which would be, which is where you ultimately can get the concept of infinity from later because if making an infinite number of divisions in this context would mean that there is there's some particular limit in any given case but in general it's unlimited there's no limit to the mathematical abstraction it's unlimited infinite basically right so so yeah now the now here's the next thing so like i understood that at one point during like maybe my second listen of this lecture i had to listen to this lecture like three or four times by the way, mm -hmm. the lecture we're talking about, we should link this. Uh, it's Achilles, the Tortoise, and the Objectivity of Mathematics yep. by Pat Corvini. So mm -hmm. in, in like I understood this by maybe the second listen, but I, what I didn't understand is this huge question for me. I said, I said, in effect, how does this solve the problem? Because there's like metaphysically speaking, there's still an infinite number of divisions. Like she's talking about a measurement process and I get it. Like your measurement process has to be some particular unit. Your, your measurement process mm -hmm. has to have some chosen division, but, but isn't it the case or might it be the case that, any particular distance is divisible in principle an infinite number of times. Aren't there in fact an infinite number of considerable distances between Achilles and the tortoise at any one moment? It doesn't seem, do you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. it doesn't seem yeah. like I she's mean, solving that, the problem here. It is true that there, it is possible to, to divide them infinitely, but you can't, um, like that's not something that you can actually do. Like this process not, of coming up it, with an, can't... like this process of coming up with an infinite number of divisions between these things is something that we completely construct in our mind. Like it's something that we completely construct to create these divisions between these things for the purpose of measurement. They're like these divisions, this this way of dividing things doesn't actually exist apart from a human form of measurement on it. Like there's no actual infinite number of divisions here. Right. Like you can divide the distance an infinite number of times, but all that exists is that distance and the relation between, them, which is just the relation between the two. There's no inherent division in that distance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, an that's the answer to my question. Yeah. That does it. Yeah. Cause yeah. Like d division dividing is something we do. It's not a thing that exists out there. So it's like, so mm -hmm. you, I mean, it's valid to ask the question, like, is there a smallest unit of space? Like maybe there is, I mean, in, mm -hmm. may, maybe there is, maybe it's like you, you, maybe at some point if you zoom in enough, you find that you can like, you know, it's sort of like a chessboard geometry at the, at the, at mm -hmm. the very bottom level. Like you can move, you know, you can move a millionth of an inch, but you can't move half a millionth of an inch um yeah. but, but even we don't like, have the answer to that it, question it, yeah physically. and you, like even if there was that wouldn't necessarily solve the problem because you can still like perceive an inf a distance between the two like you could like i don't i, well, I don't know how you'd be able to perceive it if like if they're really i i think the problem you could like can con you can conceptually still divide that even further like yeah. it's I, 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 this is this is where you need her mathematical side of the solution right this is yeah, where you need sure. to actually talk about her but math. but in the in the in the physical realm you don't actually need 
this idea of like a plank length or like the slow, smallest possible length because i think i've heard of yeah you don't physics, like, yeah they length. bring this up this idea of there being a plank length or like a, a you know um like indis- indivisible units of of length in order to solve this problem um mm-hmm. but uh but but like but you don't yeah you're right you don't need that um and the, the, the idea, be, and like, if, once you realize that division is something that we do as a process of measurement, then you can say, okay, well, if space is discrete, if spatial relationships are discrete, then obviously you can't choose a division that's smaller than the Planck length or whatever you want to call it, right? The smallest unit mm-hmm. of distance. You can't choose a standard that's smaller than that. Um, and so, so as a result, then the problem solves itself because you just can't physically do it. And this is what Norman Wildberger yeah. wants to do. And he just wants to get rid of the idea that you can even keep going. But, um, but, but we don't have the answer to this question. For all we know, space is continuous. Mm-hmm. Any particular spatial relationship can always be cut in half. You can always consider half of a spatial relationship. I don't, I don't see any mm-hmm. reason why you couldn't just keep chopping it but but then you realize chopping or considering different parts is something we do as a process of measurement and you will always yeah. have some length that you've chosen as your standard you'll never yep. be able to choose an infin- literally an infinitely small length as your standard mm-hmm. um, for sure yeah yeah and i guess i guess now like we can now that we've kind of resolved that that perspective on it we can move on to the mathematical abstraction because in the abstract sense you can divide there's no limit there's no actual limit ab- abstractly to the amount that you can divide a certain distance um, because when you form this concept of infinite divisibility it comes from this this sort of uh this sort of division where it says that okay there must be some length but it can be any length there's no actual limit to that length and it applies basically open endedly to this to this sort of process this this concept of of infinite divisibility so in the in a mathematical sense achilles does have to complete an infinite number of divisions because he has to complete in he has to complete basically as many or i like he, he would have to complete an infinite number of divisions because in this concept of an infinite sequence he has to pass every single um he has to get to that point in reality where shit i'm losing my train of thought um he has to get to that point he has to basically pass as many divisions as he has to pass basically uh mm, i'm i'm struggling to explain this but i i i remember i remember the specific quote um but i don't remember the specific quote um but basically, like he would, in a mathematical, mathematically abstract sense, have have to complete an infinite number of divisions. But he can do that in a in in a abstract mathematical sense because all that it means to complete an infinite number of divisions means to basically, in reality, in each individual context, it means to complete as many divisions as is required before it becomes um, perceptually indistinguishable from from the previous right but now you're going back to the idea that now you're going back when you when you say that you're going back to the idea of our measurement process having a particular identity and cutting off at a particular point like like Mm -hmm. let's say achilles had to run the square root of two miles okay so he runs one mile and you're like hey you still got a little left all right, I'll run 0.4 miles. All right, you still mm-hmm. got a little left. All right, I'll run one hundredth of a mile. You still got a little left. Okay, I'll run two thousandths of a mile. You know, 1.4, 1, yeah. 2. He's going through all the different decimal places of the square root of 2. Mm-hmm. Like, at some point, based on your measurement apparatus, the distance that he's run is indistinguishable from the square root of 2 miles. Or, yeah. well, hold on. Yeah, or, or his, his measurement, your measurement apparatus, your, according to your measurement apparatus, at some point Achilles has run further than the square root of two miles because the, like mm-hmm. you'll reach some decimal on, on some part of the decimal expansion. You've been, you've, Achilles' distance will be measured as being, diff, as being larger 
then the decimal expansion brought out to like let's say four decimal places it's like we i need to like like write up what it is i'm trying to say here mm -hmm. um yeah no but like yeah but like mathematically he like there's no set limit on what that can be like when you form that concept there is no specific limit on what it can be yeah in the realm of mathematics you can make as many divisions as you want but you'll on, you'll only ever mm -hmm. make some yeah, in reality number of divisions is the mm -hmm. idea yep, in, in reality you do that yep that's, and in that's reality the case. well i mean yeah whenever you're actually applying the number whenever you're actually applying mm -hmm. the number say when you're applying the square root of neg uh, the square root of two you're always going to apply a certain number of divisions also known as you're only going to use a certain number of decimal places yeah but then but, mathematics but, but when you when you form this mathematical concept of division it has to apply to every every case every single case of when you would need to defi um, divide something so you would ultimately it and it ultimately is this sort of concept of infinite divisibility because you you sort of uh because you you have to make it so that it's there's no specific limit to that that is enforced by the mathematics so that it applies to every single situation exactly. regardless of what that limit is yeah I, um, it's almost like i don't like the word infinity um because it's it's too tied up with other things especially when you don't have to use that word you can just say yeah the mathematics gives us an open-ended procedure for finding any level of accuracy you desire or you can say the square root of two its decimal expansion goes on forever because it the square root of two mm -hmm. like as a concept its accuracy is one of the omitted measurements of the concept as you said like yeah. the the, the accurate yeah, but... measurement accuracy is an omitted measurement so mm -hmm. the decimal yeah, expansion there's... can be brought out as many to, to some extent but to any extent yeah and i mean that's that's where the concept of infinity can be valid though like that's where we can because yeah. that's how that's sort of how pat corvini defines infinity yeah like there's th this lack of limit to the amount of divisions that we can make um and that's right. how she that's how that's how she resolves the resolves the paradox from a mathematical sense when where she accepts the first premise but rejects the second where she says that achilles can make or has to make an infinite number of steps he has to take an infinite number of steps here but he can do that because all that it means for him to have to take an infinite number of steps would mean that he has to take as many steps as 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 is required for the distance between the two to be indistinguishable well he can do that in any given case so mathematically when you form this concept we realize that okay he has to make these infinite number of steps but he can do that in any single given case so when you form the concept he can make an infinite number of of uh steps in 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 a abstract mathematical sense i see what you're saying i mean in this case he's not actually taking the steps though like it's just that i see what you're saying i don't know if i agree though does she say that i don't remember i think this this is this is essentially what i remember her argument okay to be. huh so yeah that's that's cool because i mean that that's how she defines the concept of infinity it's simply this open-ended sort of application to uh to that to each physical concept where it's this sort of concept formed from each individual instance where you omit the measurements of the measurements where you omit the specific limits yeah yeah harry bins I'll, i I'll, i i remember harry benzwanger does not use the word infinity he he mm -hmm. he does not like actually using that word um yeah yeah but i mean i'm, we don't, I'm not we don't i'm need that word but in, in, the, in the actual like mathematical sense it can be like that's how like if we want to say like okay when we're taking like an infinite sum of something mm -hmm. like let's say it's the infinite sum uh the convergent series of uh one, one half to the power of n where n goes right let's say you're infinity. adding one like what's the same heading yeah. one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth etc yeah and then we realize that that ultimately is going to equal uh one but well because because in each in each does it ultimately well, equal one there is no ultimately or yeah it, it i mean like that, that that's just that's just the word that i use that was, well yeah but this is kind of my point mm -hmm. like is is there any sense in which maybe i'm get maybe i'm maybe even though i have corvini's solution i'm not actually like applying it but see, see to me like no you you, you never reach one 
there there comes a point at which when you apply this series you're so close to one that your measurement apparatus can't tell the difference physically when you're applying the series in a physical situation you reach a point at which the series is indistinguishable from one based on your current measurement apparatuses Mm -hmm. but qua the series itself you never but math math is the science of measurement though Mm -hmm. that's that's what you're doing with with mathematics and that what what infinity means in this context is just as, as many as you need to do to get to that point where it's indistinguishable from what it converges to. So you'd make as many additions as you need to, to reach that, but there's no specific number in any given context. Yeah. Right. So it never reaches one. Ooh, but it does though. No, but it does in the mathematical sense. I think I see what you're saying. Like it is equal to one in the, in the mathematical mm-hmm. sense, the series is equal to yep. one. Just like if you were to produce a series uh, you know, representation of the square root of two, like that equals the square root of two. Yep. Like that equals is not, it seems like it's a different concept than equals though. Like it, what do you mean? It is the square root of two. Cause that's what it well, th- is. Well, think, think of it, think the about square root in of the two context of is a, is a procedure that approximates a, that uh, is a procedure for approximating a relationship to any desired um, you know, um, like degree of accuracy that to me, that's yep. what the square root, like, that's the way I think of it. The square root of two is, is a measurement procedure for capturing a relationship between two quantities. That's what the square root of two is to, like, as far as I'm sure. concerned. So like when you say, and, and, and we have a series of, approximation for the square root of two it's a ser- it's a certain rule for generating numbers that get you closer and closer right yeah but then but then we do say that that ultimately equals it i mean think think into uh think back to uh, mathematics is it, about the I world do you do you know do you know it. do you know from robert robert knapps that whole mm-hmm. example of the triangles where it's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. oh you see eventually as you get more and more precise that there's that extra side mm-hmm. which i didn't notice in my video when i recorded my triangle video <laughs> Because <laughs> you were too busy with with librarian madness because you're just like, oh, oh my yes. God, this is so funny or bigger. I keep making yes. it. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I've watched yeah, that video like, of yours like six times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and, and then, but then, but then, bigger. <laughs> yeah, oh man. Um, but like yeah yeah so you were making maybe 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 the, maybe the idea maybe the idea of uh, equals doesn't actually apply in this context but we say that that is like a triangle like it equals a tri- shit what's what's a, what's a better example like let's say i'm trying to think of well, an example that he used in the book measurement within a certain measurement standard it's a triangle with yeah certain, and it is a triangle actually, like it let's actually tell the is audience a triangle what the hell we're talking about so the, in in robert knapp's book in Robert Knapp's book, he shows you a triangle. There it is. And there's the book. Mathematics is about the world. Oh, uh, where's the he, triangle? Where's the you triangle? can even find this page. It's not too hard because there's a just a giant scary triangle. Yeah, show him the scary triangle. So he's That's got this little triangle, triangle and he says, hey, is that a triangle? But then he zooms in and you can see on camera that there's this tiny little edge that's been chopped off that actually makes this a quadrilateral technically. And yeah. so you can make the argument like, okay, well, it was never a triangle to begin with. And this is the sort of thing that has caused people like Plato to say, oh, well, the real world doesn't have any triangles in it. Mm-hmm. So there must be some kind of mystical triangle out in the world of the forms. But Knapp is saying, well, no, the triangle is, is how does he say this? The, you know, the triangle is a concept which is defined in a certain way. And certain objects, when measured within a certain measurement li- limitations, are triangles, including this one when you make it small enough. But then when we make yep. it bigger, you can clearly see with your eyeballs that it's no longer, it's not a triangle. But it depends on your measure, yep. your standard of measurement. Mm-hmm. And it, I, it's that same, it's this, it, the same principle applies with the, with basically all sort of like all these irrational numbers, even with the square root of two like that like it actually is a triangle like the the smaller one that that's actually is a triangle right and we within can refer to a, it as a within triangle certain measurement parameters within the measurement yeah. parameters of your eyeballs you can't tell yeah 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 and <laughs> although, it's it's a, it's the same it's the same sort of thing with the although with the, when i first yeah. read this i looked at the small triangle and put my eyeball real close and i could tell it wasn't a triangle even on the print well you can <laughs> 
anyway. You can, you can, I, feel, I mean, technically, you can sort of see that with any triangle because there's going to be a point where those two atoms are going to be like... Or two dots of ink, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So the idea is, is here's... You can see that this is a quadrilateral, but then this... But then, like, if you make it smaller, you can't... It looks like a triangle now. So within that range of measurements, mm -hmm. it's indistinguishable from a triangle. And, and therefore, within for whatever purpose you're using it for... It is a triangle. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that's just Cute a words. geometric version of what we're talking about when we talk about these infinite decimal expansions for something like the square root of two. So the square root of two exists in that it's a way, it's, it's a standard for relating measurements. And so does a triangle. Mm -hmm. It exists as an abstraction in order to relate measurements. And in certain contexts, you know, different amounts of precision are required. And so the, the concept of the triangle and the concept of the square root of two give you the procedure for dealing with any yep. level of measurement accuracy. Yep, absolutely. I think and, the, and, the, and the mathematical concept is it, it has this accuracy or it takes this accuracy and makes it open-ended basically it'll miss that measurement of precision yeah I, I think a huge part of this <laughs> like i think 90 percent of this battle is remembering that mathematics is about measurement a yeah. lot of people will say like oh well mathematics refers to reality and that's true but how yeah. does it refer to reality? Are the numbers actually out there, like in existence, like floating around? Like is the gravitational field actually a number floating around in space that tells you like thou shalt have this much acceleration at when you, you know, you are at this location? Yeah, like it's not, the number isn't out there. It's that we measure these things. All that's out there are things. And we compare some things against other things and that's called a measurement. And we put a number on that comparison. So that's like numbers relate to, numbers aren't in reality. They are our means of comparing things in reality. And if you just remember that, yeah. so much of this mathematical Platonism just drops away. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um. <laughs> I'm trying to think about how, 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 how we're gonna connect this back to the, to the uh paradox but i think i think we've essentially like covered most of what it is that that we have to resolve in that because we mentioned the whole we mentioned the physical example in every physical example there's going to be a limit and like there becomes a point where the points are indistinguishable and the mathematical abstraction this is, there's this idea that there's no specific limit and and this idea of infinity here is basically saying that there's no specific limit but it has to be some limit somewhere and to make an infinite number of divisions and to cross those infinite number of divisions basically means that you have to make as many divisions as is required and cross as many divisions as is required by your by your individual context. And that's what it means to make an infinite number of divisions and to cross those infinite number of divisions. Now there's no specific number of divisions that you have to cross. There's no specific number of divisions that you can make, but in every single context, you will be able to make a certain number of divisions. There will be some limit, and you will, you will be able to cross that number of divisions. And that solves Zeno's paradox. I don't, I don't know. I, I think you may have verbally slipped in there somewhere. Most, most of that sounded right, though. Um. It's possible. Um, I hope I, hope <laughs> I did. Because at one point you, did, you did. said that we can cross an infinite number of divisions. Yeah, in, 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 the, in Corvini's definition of infinity, you can. In, in in the mathematical abstract yeah, sense, not yeah. in the physical world. When you when you when you think about infinity as this open-ended concept referring an, an infinite number of divisions as an open-ended concept referring to the fact that in any specific case, there's no specific limit to the number of divisions you can make. In that sense, it is unlimited, infinite. That's that's where you get that where that's how you're, she defines the concept of infinity. You're not crossing the divisions though. Like the divisions, the the divisions exist as a potential as an unlimited potentiality in your measurement yeah, and, process. You're not crossing the divisions. You're not crossing the yes, divisions. It, it, it any exists more as, than... a, as a potentiality, as an abstract mathematical potentiality. And this is this is actually how Aristotle defined infinity. He had defined it as like a pure potential. 
and that like she mentions it she actually mentioned this at the beginning of her, one of her lecture at her of her lectures pat corvini did and she said he said that infinity is a potential but we're not exactly sure what that means because he didn't yeah. elaborate much on it but i yeah. think this might be what he means this sort of idea that there is this potential to make more divisions but it's not an actual thing so aristotle seemed to got it, get infinity right in this context yeah I the the way I would classify the way I would connect these two things and and this sort of sheds light on Corvini's solution is that Zeno is mixing up the metaphysical and the it's it's actually Zeno who's mixing yeah. up the metaphysical and the epistemological the divisions yeah. only exist all that exists are distances the divisions mm -hmm. only exist so far as we divide them, only so far as we take a given distance and we say, hey, how many of those distances do you need to line up to make the other distance? That's the only sense in which the divisions exist, and divisions will always exist in some finite number. They can exist in any number, but they exist in a finite number. But if you think that this process of division exists in the world, then you'll say, huh, how does Achilles cross an infinite number of distances? That's wacky. Like that, it can't be the mm -hmm. case. But he doesn't have to. This is why I'm insistent that he doesn't cross the distances or that he doesn't cross the divisions. Because the divisions are something sure. we do. It's not something Achilles crosses. He crosses the distance. He doesn't cross the but divisions. In the, he crosses in, the in distance the sense and then we make divisions in order to understand how far he went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but like we have the potential here to make an infinite number, like not a, like abstractly with that, with Corvini's specific definition of infinity, we have the potential to make any amount of divisions in an unlimited sense. There's no specific limit. Yeah. And in each, each possible sense, every time that we do that, Achilles will cross those divisions in every single, in every single one. So that's that's the sense in which Achilles does cross he, he an infinite number of divisions the in of in the in the pure abstract conceptual sense. He, he, that's he crosses the a distance which could potentially be divided as many times as you'd like. Yep. And in the in in the mathematical sense that that's that's what Corvini refers to as an infinite number of divisions. I'm not sure if I'm on board with you, but I'm also not interested in nitpicking that any further. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can, we, we can apply we this to on, like, yeah, I don't can think apply we've this concept of infinity to, nah, we keep, yeah, we could, we could apply this concept of infinity, to, infinity to other like situations of infinity. Like think about the counting numbers, for example, you, you can like keep going up one, keep going up one for every single counting number. Um, and so we say there's an infinite number of counting numbers. Now, in each individual context, there's going to be some limit to the amount of numbers that you can count. Like, there's a certain limit to the amount of sheets of paper in the world, or amount of places you can write the numbers in the world. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, however, there there is no specific limit. There's no specific limit in any given instance. So, in that sense, we say the amount of counting numbers is infinite. And this is, I mean, this 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 is like the same definitions of infinity here. I see. You, the reason you're adamant about this is you want to save, you want to make sure there's room for the concept of infinity because you think it really does refer to something. It refers to this property of our measurement methods. Yeah. The, un, the, yeah. the fact that conceptually, like there's a, we ab, we, ab, when we abstract away, there is no specific limit. And like it's the abstraction is unlimited it's infinite yeah that's that's what i that's what i mean yeah i understand yeah that makes that makes sense i don't know if i agree but that that definitely makes sense um on your your argument sounds good to me there like yeah, i think i think this is essentially what corvini's argument was though okay. when I, like from my understanding of it okay I don't remember that part. So yeah, and I, and I know that Benzwinger. I remember at one point Benzwinger arguing against the use of the word infinity, and I remember being convinced. So that's why hmm. I don't remember exactly what it was though. So I might need to read the Benzwinger stuff then, because yeah. that that could be interesting. I'll I'll give I, one I, more. I yeah, I know Benzwinger makes some like really good arguments about infinity, and I've read I've read certain things that he's written. Like I know Puya has sent me stuff before about like Ben Swinger and infinity. Cause I've talked to him about mathematics before and 
So I know Ben Swinger says good stuff, but he seems to be like when he talks about infinity, he seems to be saying that there's no, there is a limit in every particular instance. So we can't say infinity. We can't say something is infinite in infinite in the physical world. But I guess my argument would be that there is like in the, in the conceptual sense, there isn't no particular limit. It's unlimited in that sense. Okay. Let me write something down for sure. And then also ulti- like ultimately the, uh, Pat Corvini's kind of like a final uh, wrap up for this paradox. She she goes into a lot more after that because she kind of applies these principles just to mathematics in general in her third lecture. But her ultimate like conclusion is that Zeno's paradox conflates the abstract with the concrete. She basically explains that to accept the premises as true here, like you have to be able to first say like, okay, for the first premise, Achilles must complete an infinite number of divisions okay, this is true in the mathematical abstract sense and in the way that I've defined infinity here or in the way that we defi- we have fo- formed a proper concept of infinity here. Um, Achilles does have to do that and that's in the abstract sense. So it, you look at this problem initially as this abstract problem, but then you take it down in the second premise, you take it down to an individual concrete. So you go from this broad abstraction and accept a pr- premise as true in that broad abstract sense down to a concrete in the specific in the second one and you're saying okay achilles can't complete an infinite number of divisions so then in this you have to like smuggle in the fact that okay this is a concrete race right and then conclusion achilles can't complete an infinite number of divisions however when you properly separate out the two and realize that the first premise to accept it you have to be referring to the abstract abstract sense of infinity and the second premise you have to be referring to the concrete sense of infinity which doesn't exist by the way there is no concrete sense of infinity yeah 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 i see okay yeah that's a good that's a good reason for keeping the word infinity because infinity is a is a attribute of like infinity when properly used is an attribute of our measurement process but not an attribute of the actual physical race and so if you start mm-hmm. if you start mixing the two up, then it then you start getting some really funny looking stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I like and there's a, like a lot of reasons that I want to hold on to this concept of infinity. It's it's required very much for calculus. It's required for most of like continuous uh most continuous forms of mathematics. We need this concept of, of infinity. So it's important that we can keep this concept of infinity, but we can't apply it in two particular instances and assume that infinity is true in any given particular instance. Yeah. So I was actually, so I was actually going to show an instance of calculus um, real quick to the audience. Um, I'll screen share it to you so you can see what I'm saying. Um, Let's see. Hopefully it comes up in your window because it might, it might just like cover my whole screen. So we'll see. Oh, you don't want it screen shared onto your side. Oh, what's happening? Am I screen sharing? Uh, yeah. Can you see what's going on? Yeah, there? it just it just it just looks really bad in my OBS. So oh, maybe I'll I actually see. maybe uh, I'll maybe I'll add a hold up. Let me add a. Uh, <laughs> this may be more trouble than it's worth. I'll I'll Google the capture. picture while you do this. A uh, full screen. <laughs> oh, let's okay, see. There we go. Um, yeah, let's do this. Okay. So now they see my full screen. Dope. All right. There we go. So let's see. Is it even working? Okay. Yeah. So I'm showing you guys the method of exhaustion here. And this is a method of calculating the area of a circle. Hopefully no dirty pictures come up. All right, yeah, no no <laughs> dirty math pictures. It turns out. Uh, I'm always worried when I like go, like show my oh, yeah. screen isn't, on. Oh, isn't I this sh- how uh, Archimedes figured out the area of a circle? Um, did this, Archimedes that, do this? Uh, yeah, it may have been Archimedes. Because I know I know I, I just I just read something about the method of exhaustion in Archimedes somewhere. Yeah. So I don't yeah. think I read it in any objectivist sources. Though. I think I was just looking at the history of math or something. Mm. And then I saw like, oh, he used this, this theory, this like method of exhaustion, which is similar, which was like similar to modern day calculus to some extent. Oh, it's absolutely similar to calculus. Um, 
This is actually, this is some, I mean, Corvini talks about these methods in her other lectures. So when you get to those, you'll be able to see its similarity to calculus. So what, what, what I guess Archimedes, maybe Archimedes, what he does is, is he, he takes a square, then he considers mm -hmm. an octagon, which is inscribed within this circle. Then he takes, then he considers a 16 agon. Then from there, he might consider, you know, a 32 agon. And you can see that each time he increases the number of sides for this uh, regular polygon, he's getting closer and closer to the actual area of the circle. And so you can approximate the size of the circle or, or the area of the circle by taking these smaller and smaller polygons. But what the Greeks did is they actually said, okay, wait a second. Or what, well, what maybe what Archimedes did, whoever came up with the method of exhaustion, what he did was, is he said, wait a second. As the number of sides gets larger and larger, does it actually get closer and closer to the area of the circle or does it converge upon some other area? And he, he, makes, he makes a certain kind of argument, a sort of indirect proof that yes, in fact, it does exactly equal the area mm. as you go to an infinite number of terms. But this is again, infinite, this is again, really interesting um, towards your point, Garrett, which is, um, I'm going to stop screen sharing. We don't need to keep looking at this. All right, for sure. Hold up. Let me fix my okay. uh, camera quick. What's interesting is that... There we go. Like, at no point do you actually have a circle. You'll always have some polygon sure, with can... some certain number of sides. But the question is, is that is this a valid method at each individual measurement accuracy for approximating a circle. And the only way you can do that is by asking, does it equal a circle when you have an infinite number of sides? And and like as the number of sides gets larger and larger, does it keep yep. getting close? Does it in fact keep getting closer and closer to the, the size of the circle? You have to prove that in order to show that this is a valid method of measurement. And that's why you need to, that's why, I, I guess this might be why you need, I'm not convinced yet, but this is really strong argument that you need the concept of infinity here. Yeah. You actually need to say, okay, will this work for any num? really? Will this work for any number of polygon sides? Yeah. No matter how big it gets, will it keep actually getting closer? So that's why we need mm -hmm. the idea, I guess. Yeah, for sure. And this is one thing that I like, this is one thing where I think limits are absolutely genius because it like lim the use of limits actually preserves in a sense, this, uh, this definition of, an, of infinity, because it basically says you're getting like uh, getting closer and closer to this point where it's indistinguishable basically. And once you, once you reach that point in any given concrete instance, you, it is indistinguishable from infinity or indistinguishable from, or as high as you can possibly go basically, or in a, in a specific, uh, infinite division it's as far divided as possible where you can't tell the difference between the two but you can do that for basically um any possible distinguishability limit and a limit does that huh that you, seems that seems to be like how the definition of limit works you're my thinking of that's sort of how i'm conceptualizing delta, you're thinking of the epsilon delta definition i I'm not sure. I don't. Okay. I don't know what the. Have I just. You, I just know. I just know. I just know the idea of just making a number smaller and smaller and getting it closer to. I a see. Oh, number. okay, okay. Because I actually am playing with an idea of do of formulating calculus without limits. Hmm. Um, with like using What's, this idea, using this idea of like remember, like it's some standard of measurement. Um. Hmm. like using this standard of measurement instead of thinking about a limit. But I, I, what I kind of wonder, I wonder if the epsilon delta definition of a limit actually captures that or not. Yeah. What, what's the epsilon delta definition of a limit? I'm not sure how to like explain it quickly. It's very technical, but basically it's a, it's a, it's a very rigorous way of explaining what we mean by X approaches zero. Like mm -hmm. what is approach? What does it mean to approach zero? Like with a limit, you're saying as this, as the independent variable of a function approaches H, 
Yeah. The, or I don't know. How do they say some I, as the I, independent I, variable of a function approaches a number, the value of the function approaches the limit. Well, what does it mean mm. to approach? And so yeah. Couchy I guess, comes I guess up with this my, rigorous definition. Uh, I guess my like sort of initial thought in a good way to sort of define this would be to come is basically like some sequence that like a, like gets closer and closer to the certain number and gets to a point in every every instance where it's indistinguishable from it in every particular instance however there's like no specific there's no specific defined number of divisions that one would have to make I, think I guess that that's that's how that's how I conceptualize a limit. We have to come up with some sequence. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds pretty damn good. That sounds like kind of new. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say it that way. Huh. Did I just? Did I just? No, I mean, did that I just seems come good. up with a revolutionary mathematical Maybe. idea? Well, I, mean, I don't think I did. I think it's it all based more, on Corvini. But like that that seems that's something to keep in your head right there, because um, it's applying this idea of you know some but any, and then applying it to calculus to make the concept of approach really clear um yeah hmm yeah i just because i know i know that in like calculus one classes when they're defining limit for the first time mm -hmm. it's always like like they start with like what is what is the value of the function at one and then at point one and then at point oh one and then like you do that on both sides of it and then you get to this point where it's like, oh, this like this eventually is just completely indistinguishable from these are like indistinguishable from each other on both sides. And we say that's what it converges to. Well, they don't use the standard of indistinguishability because they're not thinking about actual. I, I guarantee you no calculus book is actually going. To oh, sure. What they're yeah. saying to measurements. There's, there's, that's, you at, there, I'm there, saying that's you adding the last step. You're saying at any hmm. interval, as you get closer at any interval, does that at every interval are you are you is your is is the value of the function indistinguishable from the limit at smaller and smaller measurement granularities maybe like yeah. is is kind of is is how you'd apply that yeah yeah it, it it'd it be some yeah something something along i feel like i don't know I, it feels like it feels like it's just like an obvious extrapolation from Corvini's lectures along with like how they initially teach limits because that's that's kind of, that's kind of how I remember learning limits and this sort of idea of like oh there's this function where it's just going like getting smaller by a tenth each time and or it sort of becomes a sequence and then you just like calculate that value calculate that value and see what it approaches and like it eventually obviously gets to an in indistinguishable point where it equals that limit Right. Well, I mean, you can you can say that, but you know, do you know what you call an obvious extrapolation from a completely revolutionary idea when well understood? That's called a discovery. Rationalism. What? <laughs> you said rationalism. rationalism. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I said properly understood. Like that's called a discovery. Like, yeah, I mean, once you true. reach once you reach a certain level, if you ex if you extrapolate from what you know, you. Uh, you'll discover something. At least that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that's, well, I, I know that's true. I'm not just hoping for it. <laughs> yeah, so man. Maybe, it's just a matter of getting there. Maybe one day I'll be the next Robert Knapp or Pat Corvini writing a whole <laughs> book about math. That's actually one thing that I think about doing someday. Like once I, once I have a better grasp of mathematical concepts, I can just like go in and like fully like, flesh out this whole concept of like infinity or just apply like Rand's theory of concepts to different mathematical things, which that, that seems like a really fun endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to be done. There's a, there, these, these ideas, like these ideas Rand gave us just blew the lid off of tons of mysteries and we're going to be working we don't have enough people. I don't. I don't know I, what the hell am I talking about when I say we. Uh, there's a lot of 
new stuff to be learned applying these ideas and i think these these books are a real inspiration they, they show you what's possible like all this stuff that was considered yeah. just unsolvable is just boom okay now that we know that concepts are about measurement omission or at least like specifically that mathematics and numbers refer to measurement boom it's oh like all of this complicated crap with zeno and and it's like oh you're just mixing up the metaphysical and the epistemological I mean, I'm making it yeah. sound easy. It's it's hard to extrapolate from Rand and nah, apply it's it. It's very easy. Extremely it's super, easy. It's super easy. Anyone can do it. Um, Anybody can know, do it. And, or, well, it doesn't take a thing. genius. Everyone, well, <laughs> I don't think it takes a genius. I do think anyone can do it with enough effort. The, quest, the, the question sure, is, but it would, are it would you take putting like a genius to be clear? Stroke of, What's that? It takes like a genius sort of integration, like Rand's theory of concepts. Like not not everybody's going to come up with Rand's theory of concepts. I'm sure anybody technically could, but it takes like a genius amount of effort and a genius discovery in that sense. Right. Because like Kant put in a lot of effort, but he didn't he didn't come up with Rand's theory of concepts. <laughs> he put in a lot of something. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just trying to avoid, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know this this view that we're starting to see that only geniuses can contribute to philosophy or something like that or only geniuses can yeah, i mean that's philosophy not... or that, that seems to be some of the implications of sure some some of these things i that you know we've we've been arguing over in our little community yeah. i mean I, I i don't think it's entirely wrong but i don't want to get too deep into that that's yeah we don't have to discuss hole. that that's that's quite far afield so um yeah for sure but uh but yeah um i think we covered a lot that was we already did cover quite a lot this might be a good time to to end it here yeah so. we got we got a two-hour video going very in depth i think that was that was good i'm glad like i'm glad we got into all of that stuff and we covered most of what i think we initially wanted to cover anyways didn't we um yeah we we covered everything this is this is pretty much um all i'm comfortable saying on on this stuff this you know mathematics is not my that's not my primary area of study i did i did uh, think about this stuff a lot at one point but um this is the kind of thing i'm hesitant to put out work on like i guess i'd tell my viewers like this i mean i'll tell your viewers too like this is what i've said today is not kind of my official canon this is me just sort of having a conversation about a very important work, which is, yeah, um, for sure. which is, you know, mathematics is about the world by nap. And then, and then Pat Corvini's body of work. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like we're, 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 we're not, we're still learning this stuff. There's still a lot to be learned, I'd say, and a lot to, more to be thought about on these particular topics. And I'm certain that there's going to be, I'm going to look back on this in a few years and like, be like, holy shit, like this, you, you said, uh, this specific word here but you, when you should have used this word. I think, I mean, I, I'm probably going to stand by everything I say. I think the principles that I'm grasping for are true. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's still a lot to be learned and still a lot more reality to discover because yeah. reality is pretty big. Turns out it is. Yeah. Turns out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, um, did you have anything, anything else you wanted to add? That's it for me. Thanks for having me on your show, Garrett. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, thanks for coming on. Cool. So with that, uh, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next video. Peace.